Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Chapter 38 Akura's return journey and his visiting of Vishnu Loka within the Jamuna River Akura was warmly received by Lord Krishna and Nanda Maharaj and offered a resting place for the night. In the meantime, the two brothers Balaram and Krishna went to take their supper. Akura sat on his bed and began to reflect that all the desires which he had anticipated while coming from Mathura to Vrindavan had been fulfilled. Lord Krishna is the husband of the goddess of fortune. Being pleased with his pure devotee, he can offer whatever the devotee desires. But the pure devotee does not ask anything from the Lord for his personal benefit. After taking their supper, Krishna and Balaram came to bid good night to Akura. Krishna asked about his maternal uncle, Kamsa. How is he dealing with his friends? And he asked, How are my relatives? He also inquired into Kamsa's plans. The Supreme Personality of Godhead then informed Akura that his presence was very much welcome. He inquired from him whether all his relatives and friends were well and free from all kinds of ailments. Krishna stated that he was very sorry that his maternal uncle Kamsa was the head of the kingdom. He said that Kamsa was the greatest anachronism in the whole system of government and that they could not expect any welfare for the citizens while he ruled. Then Krishna said, My father has undergone much tribulation simply from my being his son. For this reason also he has lost many other sons. I think myself so fortunate that you have come as my friend and relative. My good friend Akura, please tell me the purpose of your coming to Vrindavan. After this inquiry, Akura, who belonged to the dynasty of Yadu, explained the recent events in Mathura, including Kamsa's attempt to kill Vasudev, the father of Krishna. He related the things which happened after the disclosure by Narada that Krishna was the son of Vasudev. Sitting by him in the house of Nanda Maharaj, Akura narrated all the stories regarding Kamsa. He told how Narada met Kamsa and how he himself was deputed by Kamsa to come to Vrindavan. Akura explained to Krishna that Narada had told Kamsa all about Krishna's being transferred from Mathura to Vrindavan just after his birth and about his killing all the demons sent by Kamsa. Akura then explained to Krishna the purpose of his coming to Vrindavan, to take him back to Mathura. After hearing of these arrangements, Balaram and Krishna, who are very expert in killing opponents, mildly laughed at the plans of Kamsa. They asked Nanda Maharaj to invite all the cowherd boys to go to Mathura to participate in the ceremony known as Dhanur Yagya. Kamsa wanted them all to go there to participate in the function. On Krishna's word, Nanda Maharaj at once called for the cowherd boys and asked them to collect all kinds of milk preparations and milk to present at the ceremony. He also sent instructions to the police chief of Vrindavan to tell all the inhabitants about Kamsa's great Dhanur Yagya function and invite them to join. Nanda Maharaj informed the cowherd boys that they would start the next morning. They therefore arranged for the cows and bulls to carry them all to Mathura. When the gopis saw that Akura had come to take Krishna and Balaram away to Mathura, they became overwhelmed with anxiety. Some of them became so aggrieved that their faces turned black and they began to breathe warmly and had palpitations of the heart. They discovered that their hair and dress immediately loosened. Hearing the news that Krishna and Balaram were leaving for Mathura, others who were engaged in household duties stopped working as if they had forgotten everything, like a person who was called forth to die and leave this world at once. Others immediately fainted due to separation from Krishna. Remembering his attractive smile and his talks with them, the gopis became overwhelmed with grief. They all remembered the characteristics of the personality of Godhead, how he moved within the area of Vrindavan, and how, with joking words, he attracted all their hearts. Thinking of Krishna and of their imminent separation from him, the gopis assembled together with heavy, beating hearts. Completely absorbed in thought of Krishna, tears fell from their eyes. They began to converse as follows. O Providence, you are so cruel. It appears that you do not know how to show mercy to others. By your arrangement, friends contact one another, but without fulfilling their desires, you separate them. This is exactly like children's play that has no meaning. 
it is very abominable that you arranged to show us beautiful Krishna, whose bluish curling hair beautifies his broad forehead and sharp nose, who is always smiling to minimize all contention in this material world, and then arranged to separate him from us. O oh, Providence, you are so cruel. But most astonishingly, you appear now as Akura, which means not cruel. In the beginning, we appreciated your workmanship in giving us these eyes to see the beautiful face of Krishna. But now, just like a foolish creature, you are trying to take out our eyes so we may not see Krishna here again. Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj, is also very cruel. He must always have new friends. He does not like to keep friendship for a long time with anyone. We gopis of Vrindavan, having left our homes, friends, and relatives, have become Krishna's maidservants, but he is neglecting us and going away. He does not even look upon us, even though we are completely surrendered unto him. Now all the young girls in Mathura will have the opportunity. They are expecting Krishna's arrival, and they will enjoy his sweet smiling face and will drink its honey. Although we know that Krishna is very steady and determined, we are threatened that as soon as he sees the beautiful faces of the young girls in Mathura, he will forget himself. We fear he will become controlled by them and will forget us, for we are simple village girls. He will no longer be kind to us. We therefore do not expect Krishna to return to Vrindavan. He will not leave the company of the girls in Mathura. The gopis began to imagine the great functions in the city of Mathura. Krishna would pass through the streets, and the ladies and young girls of the city would see him from the balconies of their respective houses. Mathura city contained different communities, known then as Dashara, Boja, Andaka, and Sattvata. All these communities were different branches of the same family in which Krishna appeared, namely the Yadu dynasty. They were also expecting the arrival of Krishna. It had already been ascertained that Krishna, who is the rest of the goddess of fortune and reservoir of all pleasure and transcendental qualities, was going to visit Mathura city. The gopis then began to condemn the activities of Akura. They stated that he was taking Krishna, who was more dear than the dearest to them, and who was the pleasure of their eyes. He was being taken from their sight without their being informed or solaced by Akura. Akura should not have been so merciless, but should have taken compassion on them. The gopis went on to say, The most astonishing feature is that Krishna, the son of Nanda, without consideration, has already seated himself on the chariot. From this it appears that Krishna is not very intelligent. Yet he may be very intelligent, but he is not very civilized. Not only Krishna, but all the cowherd men are so callous that they are already yoking the bulls and calves for the journey to Mathura. The elderly persons in Vrindavan are also merciless. They do not take our plight into consideration and stop Krishna's journey to Mathura. Even the demigods are very unkind to us. They are not impeding his going to Mathura. The gopis prayed to the demigods to create some natural disturbance, such as a hurricane, storm, or heavy rainfall, so that Krishna could not go to Mathura. They then began to consider, Despite our elderly parents and guardians, we shall personally stop Krishna from going to Mathura. We have no other alternative than to take this direct action. Everyone has gone against us to take away Krishna from our sight. Without him, we cannot live for a moment. The gopis thus decided to obstruct the passage through which the chariot of Krishna was supposed to pass. They began to talk among themselves. We have passed a very long night, which seemed only a moment, engaged in the rasa dance with Krishna. We were looking at his sweet smile and were embracing and talking. Now, how shall we live even for a moment if he goes away from us? At the end of the day, in the evening, along with his elder brother Balaram, Krishna would return home with his friends. His face would be smeared with the dust raised by the hooves of the cows, and he would smile and play on his flute and look upon us so kindly. How shall we be able to forget him? How shall we be able to forget Krishna, who is our life and soul? He has already taken away our hearts in so many ways throughout our days and nights, and if he goes away, there is no possibility of our continuing to live. Thinking like this, the gopis became more and more grief-stricken at Krishna's leaving Vrindavan. They could not check their minds, and they began to cry loudly, 
calling the different names of Krishna. O oh, dear Damodar, dear Madhava. The gopis cried all night before the departure of Krishna. As soon as the sun rose, Akura finished his morning bath, got on the chariot, and began to start from Mathura with Krishna and Balaram. Nanda Maharaj and the cowherd men got up on bullock carts after loading them with milk preparations, such as yogurt, milk, and ghee, filled in big earthen pots, and began to follow the chariot of Krishna and Balaram. In spite of Krishna's asking them not to obstruct their way, all the gopis surrounded the chariot and stood up to see Krishna with pitiable eyes. Krishna was very much affected upon seeing the plight of the gopis, but his duty was to start from Mathura, for this was foretold by Narada. Krishna therefore consoled the gopis. He told them that they should not be aggrieved. He was coming back very soon after finishing his business. But they could not be persuaded to disperse. The chariot, however, began to head west, and as it proceeded, the minds of the gopis followed it as far as possible. They watched the flag on the chariot as long as it was visible. Finally, they could see only the dust of the chariot in the distance. The gopis did not move from their places, but stood until the chariot could not be seen at all. They remained standing still, as if they were painted pictures. All the gopis decided that Krishna was not returning immediately and with greatly disappointed hearts, they returned to their respective homes. Being greatly disturbed by the absence of Krishna, they simply thought all day and night about his pastimes and thus derived some consolation. The Lord, accompanied by Akura and Balaram, drove the chariot with great speed towards the bank of the Jamuna. Simply by taking bath in the Jamuna, anyone can diminish the reaction of his sinful activities. Both Krishna and Balaram took their baths in the river and washed their faces. After drinking the transparent, crystal-clear water of the Jamuna, they took their seats again on the chariot. The chariot was standing underneath the shade of big trees, and both brothers sat down there. Akura then took their permission to also take bath in the Jamuna. According to Vedic ritual, after taking bath in the river, one should stand at least half-submerged and murmur the Gayatri Mantra. While he was standing in the river, Akura suddenly saw both Balaram and Krishna within the water. He was surprised to see them there because he was confident that they were sitting on the chariot. Confused, he immediately came out of the water and went to see where the boys were, and he was very surprised to see that they were sitting on the chariot as before. When he saw them on the chariot, he began to wonder whether he saw them in the water. He therefore went back to the river. This time he saw not only Balaram and Krishna there, but many of the demigods and all the Siddhas, Charnas, and Gandharvas. They were all standing before the Lord, who was lying down. He also saw the Sesha Nag with thousands of hoods. Lord Sesha Nag was covered with bluish garments, and his necks were all white. The white necks of Sesha Nag appeared exactly like snow-capped mountains. On the curved lap of Sesha Nag, Akura saw Krishna sitting very soberly with four hands. His eyes were like the reddish petals of the lotus flower. In other words, after returning, Akura saw Balaram turned into Sesha Nag and Krishna turned into Mahavishnu. He saw the four-handed Supreme Personality of Godhead smiling very beautifully. He was very pleasing to all and was looking towards everyone. He appeared beautiful with his raised nose, broad forehead, spread up ears, and reddish lips. His arms, reaching to the knees, were very strongly built. His shoulders were high, his chest very broad and shaped like the conch shell. His navel was very deep and his abdomen was marked with three lines. His waist was broad and big, resembling the hips of a woman, and his thighs resembled the trunks of elephants. The other parts of his legs, the joints and lower extremities, were all very beautiful. The nails of his feet were dazzling and his toes were as beautiful as the petals of the lotus flower. His helmet was decorated with very valuable jewels. There was a nice belt around the waist, and he wore a sacred thread across his broad chest. Bangles were on his hands and armlets on the upper portion of his arms. He wore bells on his ankles. He possessed dazzling beauty, and his palms were like the lotus flower. He was still more beautiful with different emblems of the Vishnu Murti, the conch shell, club, disc, and lotus flower, which he held in his four hands. His chest was marked with the particular signs of Vishnu, and he wore fresh flower garlands. All in all, he was very beautiful to look at. 
Akura also saw his lordship surrounded by intimate associates like the four Kumars, Sanak, Sanatana, Sananda, and Sanat Kumar, and other associates like Sunanda and Nanda, as well as demigods like Brahma and Lord Shiva. The nine great learned sages were there, and devotees like Prahlad and Narada were engaged in offering prayers to the Lord with clean hearts and pure words. After seeing the transcendental personality of Godhead, Akura immediately became overwhelmed with great devotion, and all over his body there was transcendental shivering. Although for the moment he was bewildered, he retained his clear consciousness and bowed down his head before the Lord. With folded hands and faltering voice, he began to offer prayers to the Lord. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the 38th chapter of Krishna, Akura's return journey and his visiting of Vishnu Loka within the Jamuna River. Thank you for listening. For more, click here.